I would like you all to do me a favor, a big, huge favor. I want you to close your eyes. We're going to imagine something for just a minute. And are your eyes all closed? I can't really see all your eyes. <laughs> I hope they're closed. So I want you to imagine the world we live in right now, this world that has storms coming in, um, has political strife. There's all these different bad things that come from a broken world, okay? So we live in this kind of a world, only this time I want you to imagine it without the Lord. There's no God that could answer your prayers or even hear your prayers. There's no Jesus to die for your sins and give you um, freedom from guilt, and there's no Holy Spirit to comfort you and to be your friend, and to love on you in your darkest hours. That'd be horrible. Okay, open your eyes. (laughs) The good news is, that's not the truth. We have a Heavenly Father that is real, and He loves you more than anybody in this world could ever love you. No, No man could ever love you as much as your Father loves you, okay? There's some good men out there, and they're good. But they can't love you like God, your creator, loved you, right? We do have Jesus who died for our sins. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. He died for our sins, and when we ask him to forgive us, then we're freed from the guilt of all the bad mistakes and the things we've messed up. And so that's good. And then, to beat it all, we have the Holy Spirit, which is our comforter, and he He just lives right here with us, and he's so kind and patient, and he's just the best. He just is so sweet to us, and he helps us in so many ways. So my name is Faith, and I am not a public speaker. But I love the Lord, and I am very, very grateful for the times that God has helped me through a lot of struggles. So I've been asked to speak on joy in the struggle. And we all have struggles, don't we? If you, okay, I got a question. If you've never had a struggle, I want you to hold your hand up. Where are you? I can't see you. <laughs> no, the truth is that's part of the human condition. We have to have, or we just because the world is full of sin and brokenness, there is struggle. There's ups and downs. Now, there's all kinds of struggles. When I was going through this, I, was, I actually found on the Internet that there was some kind of contest Um, for people to send in pictures of things that gave them a bad day. So there was, of course, thousands of people, and then they narrowed them down to the top, like, 200 or something like that. And out of those 200, I picked, I just picked three. I thought that were cute, talking about, these aren't memes like uh, Emily is talking about, but, but they were relatable to me anyway. There's this guy who evidently was maybe like a college student or something, and he didn't know you couldn't put Dawn soap in the dishwasher. So he's had a bad day. In his book, I guess it's a bad day. He looks pretty discouraged right there. But the good news is he's going to have a squeaky clean floor when that all goes away, when he washes it. And then this one I did. Whoops. This one I, I did. Oh, whoops, I went too far. This one is made out of avocados. I don't know what they were doing, making a smoothie with avocados. And I'm all for vegetables and stuff, but that one, ooh. Uh, but anyway, I did that with, uh, when I was first married, I was trying to make an Italian so- special sauce for Eric, and I, I guess I overfilled the blender, and it exploded all over my kitchen when I turned it on. So I had red all over the kitchen, literally over the walls and the counters. So that one was funny. That made them a bad day, evidently. And then this one, I could really understand. This one, it rated the highest of all of them I picked out because look at the top. It says, why? <laughs> Their ice cream not, didn't just melt. It fell out on the floorboard. So that really is sad. Don't you think that's sad? <laughs> so anyway, those are some, uh, some light. But the, the cool thing is they were, yeah, <laughs> put it back in there. Now, that's really desperation if you put it back in there. Oh, my lands. But um, so the, the <laughs> these were so uh, light of a struggle. 
that they were able to actually put them on the internet and, and be able to let people laugh with them at the, you know, turning around and looking back at it. So those weren't that bad, but to those people, they were enough that they could call them a struggle. So, whoops, I went one too far. It's not going back for me. Huh. There we go. I don't know why it's missing one. Okay. I will go back to the ice cream. You guys will have to put up with me because it's not, it doesn't have the one in there I wanted. <laughs> just leave it there for just a little bit. So then there are other things. You know, the whole, this is one, one version of a struggle or something bad that could happen to you. To you. But then there's the other far end. Well, let me, let me give you an idea of one that might be considered in the middle. One would be like, I pictured um, my, you know, in a van, with a van, with your little kids in, all in their seat belts, in their, their car seats. And you have a flat tire on the side of the internet, I mean the interstate. <laughs> Yeah, the internet. On the side of the inner state, and it's pouring down rain, and you've got a flat tire and three kids in the back. That could be a bad day, too, right? That's another level up from these, all right? But then there are times in our lives that are so much worse. There are times that when they hit us, we have different reactions sometimes to these things. Let's take it all the way to the furthest extreme. Um, Sometimes things hit us so bad that we're speechless, or we, we let out a, we just crumple on the floor. That's why they came up with that saying, are you sitting down? Um, because that can really happen to people. There are uh, times in our lives that things could be so drastic that it, we, it changes the course of our life, right? It's, um, it's like so bad that we, we wish we could redo it or we wish we could stop it or we wish we could just dream this all. It's a nightmare. It's going to go away when I wake up. But it's not. It is real. It is, life's never going to be the same. We, we can't go back and undo this. There are times that are that bad. And I don't know, in, in a group of ladies this big, and I don't know you all, so I don't know what's going on in your life, but you, there may be somebody here that is hurting really bad from something that they've, some news they've gotten recently, you know what I mean? And you're hurting down inside. And so, but this, the joy, I mean, the struggles can just come and go through our lives, can't they? Well, um, one of the good news, one of the good news is, is that in Romans eight twenty six, the Lord said, or Paul said that when we, face those struggles and we get speechless, which I, I don't normally get speechless. I start bawling. I usually just start crying. <laughs> but I still, sometimes I don't even know how to pray. I don't know exactly what to pray. And so the Holy Spirit, because I'm God's child, starts instantly. He, he knows what the perfect thing is that should happen, God's perfect will. So he lines up his prayer. The Holy Spirit's interceding for me with prayers that I can't even understand or I wouldn't understand, but God knows. And so that's a comfort too, isn't it? Now, when I was getting ready to make this speech, I was uh, looking back over, I've been, I'm almost 64, and I was looking back over, over my life, and I realized that a long time ago, I, re I, I loved to study the names of God. And so, out of all the names of God, they're all really good, you know. But my favorite one, personally, is Jehovah Jireh. Because it means that he sees ahead of us and provides more than enough. He's an abundant giver, a generous God that loves us so much. He's already been there. He's already got it all set up, and he knows how to handle it, right? And so, that is, that's been a blessing to me. And um, one of the things that God did, I was saved when I was seven, came to Christ when I was seven, um, and everything was hunky-dory. I grew up in a tiny little town. My dad was a pastor. My grandpa was an evangelist. And, um, and I lived in a small town where everybody knows everybody. You know what I mean? It was 525 people in the whole town in Missouri. And, um, and so I was, I've been saved 56 years now, but when I was 16, something happened to me that just rocked my world. I mean, it, it changed everything. And so what happened was I was jerked from my home, my family. I was taken 1,000 miles from home into the desert 
I grew up in this lush area in Missouri, and I was put in the desert. My parents couldn't write me. They didn't know where I was. My, I, there were no cell phones back in those days, you know what I mean? We didn't even have cell phones back then. I had no phone. I had no friends. I had one outfit on, and I, had, I was given another outfit. I had one pair of shoes, and thank the Lord, I had this tiny little Bible that was a complete Bible. It wasn't just the New Testament. So I had one thing that I could hold on to. Now, I was made to work from 7 in the morning till 5 in the evening, and no one would talk to me. I was just given the list of jobs to do, and I was made to do those. And so out of self-defense, I would get up, I would get myself up around 5 in the morning, and I would start digging into the Word of God. I mean, like there was nothing else in this world, and there wasn't for me at that time. I couldn't find, I couldn't get a hold of my parents. I could, there was no one I could call. I was basically isolated and trapped for four months. It doesn't sound that long when you say four months, big deal. I mean, you know, what's four months? But to a 16-year-old that's scared and doesn't know what's going on and they can't get back home and there's no way out of this, it was kind of devastating to me. So I poured into the, uh, I just dug into the word of God and I prayed and I prayed and I began to notice within just a few days that I began to just feel this strength and peace and and as I'd go about my jobs, I, I would just start talking to God, like I'm talking to you right now, or like I talked to my, my best friends. I would just talk out loud, literally. And so if there had been cameras around or something, they would have probably, you know, tied me up in a corner somewhere or something, you know, thought I was Looney Tunes. But the Lord became so precious and real to me during that time that it set a benchmark. And if you've ever gotten to have that sweet of fellowship through a trial with the Lord, you know there is nothing that good. And you don't ever want to go back. I mean, it is too heavenly. And so it was actually looking back on it, God took that horrific thing that happened to me and he redeemed it by, by giving me a taste of himself when no one else, it was like the whole world was gone. It was just him and me. And so finally, the good news is I did get away. I did get to go back home. And let's fast forward. Um, I finished high school, went to nursing school, met my husband and got married. Then for, we went for five years to the mission field and had a baby while we were on the mission field, a little boy, and everything was going good again. The Lord is good. I was just happy just being a wife and a, a mom and everything, it was good. And so then we decided after five years that we wanted my husband to get a degree because um, we, we had left straight from getting married basically into the mission field, and he didn't have a degree yet. So we felt like the Lord was saying it was okay, it was time. So we moved uh, to Dallas, and he was starting his degree. Now, I had my degree, so I was able to work, and so I worked as a nurse and a full-time job, and then I worked uh, a half-time job to put him through school. And, um, and so everything was, like I said, going along good and everything. And then I got pregnant and had a little boy, and he was peaches and cream. He was just a big smile all the time. He was happy. We were good. Everything was still good. And so um, the place where I worked, my full-time job, I drew a lot of blood, and I worked in it partly in an ER and all this kind of stuff. And lo and behold, um, when my youngest one was like a, not quite a year old, I got pregnant again. And so I'm busy. I just, I'm puking my socks up because how many of you have ever gotten that sick, you know, really bad when you're pregnant? Am I the only one? Oh, my lands. I was going to say, oh, if I'm the only one, I'm running out of here. <laughs> I thought, I'm like, something weird wrong with me. But anyway, so I was puking my socks up and trying to work in the clinic and work the second job and take care of my boys. And um, I just, something was wrong, though. This time, there was something really strange. And I couldn't put it, figure it out. I just kept putting it off as well it's my it's this busyness it's this constant I don't get any hardly any rest you know I could relate to Emily on that one 
not, just you got a lot on your plate. So I was just, but I had a headache that wouldn't go away for, for like the first three months, basically. And all my joints hurt. And I thought, now oh, that's unusual. That I, I don't know what's causing that. But I got to finally get in to see my obstetrician, Dr. Pierce. He's an older, very experienced, sweet Christian doctor. And I said, Doc, I said, uh, you know, I don't know. This, this doesn't seem normal to me. I, I don't know. What's wrong? Um, but they checked me out. They did all these tests. And they said, well, let me send you for a sonogram, you know. So I said, okay, that'll be great. I told my mom about it. Mom, I'm going to get a sonogram. You want to go with me? And she goes, yeah, because I was the oldest daughter. And, and she hadn't been in to see a sonogram before. So we were in there together. And a really good friend of mine, um, Dr. Pummel, was a radiologist. And he came in just to do it for me himself. And so we're just chit-chatting. And he's got my, the Doppler going on my tummy. And we're just all laughing and having a good time. And... All of a sudden, he stops talking, and he gets quiet, and, and I'm watching him. I'm trying, you know how you look when you try to see the screen, and you're trying to make heads or tails of it yourself, and he's just still doing all this, and he finally picks up the Doppler off me and puts it on the little shelf thing, and he goes, Faith, get dressed. I said, okay. What, what's wrong? Didn't answer me. Just sped out of the room. In a little bit, he came back in, and he says, um, Dr. Pierce is going to call you, his office is going to call you this evening, and either get you in this evening or maybe early in the morning. I said, okay, what, what's the matter? And he said, I, I can't say right now. Why don't you just talk to Dr. Pierce? I said, oh, okay. So the next morning I went in, and my sweet doctor, you know, he didn't pray with me, but he had a very good demeanor, very sweet demeanor and he said faith this is this is what's happened um we don't know how or where you got it but you came down with the cytomegalovirus which is very drastic i mean it's not bad if you're not pregnant you'll get through it but you got it in the first trimester when all the neuron tubes are being formed and the brains being formed and because of that your baby from the waist down is normal. It is a healthy five-month-old baby. But from the waist up, your baby stopped growing at three months. So the spine's not long enough or developed. The brain is shrunken and it doesn't look good. The hands are terribly deformed. And on top of that, um, cytomegalovirus is infamous for making the person that is in utero deaf and blind. And on top of that, your amniotic fluid is dried up to a fourth of a cup. <laughs> so the baby can't turn, the baby can't move. And your blood pressure is too low to perfuse the placenta. <laughs> and I'm listening to all this and I'm just, you know, trying to absorb it. And he goes, so you've got to go home and lay on your left side for the next four months. And he said, I don't want you out of that bed except to tinkle a few times a day. You, your job is to stay on your left side and perfuse that placenta if you want to keep this baby. And so I said, yes, sir. So I, I get home. We changed our lifestyle a little bit. We moved in with my parents. And so they could take my one son to the daycare and now to the daycare. We got a daycare thing. And then the other son to school. And my husband was, had a job, and so he was going over to Plano to work. So what do you think I did with my time there on my left side? Wow. Yes. I got time, more time to uh, read the Word of God. And it was, it's just I, one of my favorite things. I also was looking at baby names because, to me, names are so important. They give a child, they can give a child a sense of, identity kind of, you know, your, your name is important, I think. And so, anyway, so I was reading through the Bible, and one day I was reading in, whoops, I was reading in, why now I'm not getting it, oh, there it is, Luke 8, 1 through 3, and it says when Jesus, talking about Jesus, when he came down, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. 
and Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. And I think it was with amazing compassion and said, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And immediately I heard that voice that I had heard when I was isolated say loud and clear in my spirit, faith, called me by name. He said, faith, you've only asked me for grace. You haven't asked me for healing. I can do anything. And I said, Lord, you're right. See, we had two healthy boys, and we had told our little church, about 120 people, we had told them that we were asking for grace. Would they pray for us to raise this? Because we had a nephew that was going was exactly like what it, I was going to be dealing with, and we knew how critical this was. So we were just asking for grace. I was determined not to have a, an abortion. <laughs> anyway, so... I had many, many, many more sonograms throughout. About every two weeks, they would do another sonogram, hoping, they were hoping that something had changed. So one of those sonograms was down at uh, Southwestern, you've all heard of uh, Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. It's a, a research, basically, a training and research, high tech. And so um, when they did that sonogram, I, I mean, all the sonograms were good, but that one was like, a 3D black and white photograph that was so so clear it was unbelievable and when they showed me that they these two people in the room said are you sure you want to continue this pregnancy because it is bad 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 it is not good and that was like maybe four weeks I think it was before she was born and I said I am not having an abortion this is not gonna happen and so they just, you know, when you say it the right way, <laughs> they just quit talking to me on that one. But anyway, so, uh, so that was that. So then about two weeks before she was due, I went into labor. Now, they had alerted the level three intensive care at St. Paul's Hospital in Dallas. They had um, nurses on, ready for her, incubator, every, everything ready. They had brought two neonatal specialists from Southwestern into the delivery room to be there to consort with each other on how to handle this crisis. Um, they were doing a C-section with, um, with a spinal, and so Eric had been in with me on my last baby. I'd had a spinal, and Eric was sitting right here and holding my hand like a good husband, and um, after they cut me open, I realized that that spinal didn't really take. And I was like, you know, I'm cut open, and this isn't working. And the anesthesiologist, I heard somebody go, get that husband out of the room. Because they could see, you know, he's red, complected naturally. He was really pale about to pass out. They don't need a six foot six guy on the floor of the OR and while they're trying to deliver a baby. And so they got him out of there. And immediately the anesthesiologist clasped the, the thing, the mask deal. She's going to just put me out. And God is so, so good because he, th th she put that thing over my mouth. And you know how they tell you to count from 199, count as far as you can, 98, 97, you know what I mean? And right before I passed out, the Lord let me hear some nurse somewhere in that delivery room say, Doctor, this baby looks fine to me. And I went, woohoo! <laughs> I was like, so, I don't know if I was really crying here, but you know how a mom's heart, I, tears of gratitude in my heart to God again for what he had done. Now, I didn't know at the time, you know, what exactly still had happened. I passed out, with, and thankfully, so they could sew me up and put me back together. Anyway, they kept testing her for three days solid. I mean, those guys were on her, like, testing her with every test they could. And finally, on the third day, one of those neonatal specialists from Southwestern came in my, my room he had his white lab coat on and everything, and he goes, uh, Mrs. Bowman, you know, with the cytomegalovirus and all those sonograms, this was really, really serious. And um, he said, but we've tested your daughter. She's not deaf. She's not blind. She's great and alert, highly acute, 
and her hands aren't deformed. And he said, sometimes science can't explain these things. <laughs> <laughs> so I waited very politely till he was all done saying his piece because I wanted to hear it. <laughs> I wanted to hear him admit <laughs> science couldn't explain all these things. And so then I said, you know, I'm a nurse, and I know what the cytomegalovirus does. And I saw all those, like, 10 sonograms that confirmed how horrible it was. But there were hundreds of people. By this time, you know how people tell people to pray for people, and it's really wonderful network. I said, by this time, there were hundreds of people asking God, and for some reason, out of his goodness, he healed this little girl, and that's what happened. And he just, he couldn't even process that. He turned around, and he walked out of the room. But anyway, so my daughter has been um, a real joy to me. She's been raised with her three brothers. I had one more after, after her. And so I love to tell this story because I'm just so, so blessed. Now, I want to tell you one other funny thing. This is about the sense of humor God has that I didn't know for 15 years. Now, you can't hardly see this, but I'll, I'll explain it to you. Anyway, so this is, um, well, let me tell you something else first. So Kristen grows up. She's 15. She takes her first elective in high school. She's at Flower Mound High School over in, in uh, Flower Mound. And um, she took art, which is good, you know. And um, she took it the second year. And the sec second year, the doctor, <laughs> the doctors, the teacher, teacher told them they had to pick out an area of concentration that second year. And they were going to focus on that for the whole year. So, you know, one day Kristen came home from high school and she said, well, Mom, I picked out my area of concentration. I said, good, what is it? She goes, I'm going to paint hands. And I didn't, you know, I just kind of froze because what I saw was a 4.0 circle in the drain. You know, her, her grade point average, I just pictured, it's just going to go down. This isn't going to be good. I said, babe, do you know how hard hands are to paint? Has anybody told you that? And she goes, I know, I know, but that's what I want to paint. I said, okay. And I'm thinking, here we go. But that artist right there is asking the lady to put on uh, boxing gloves. Because like he says, I can't paint hands to save my life. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, it's a well-known thing. I bet we have some artists in here, and I bet you would vouch for that. Yes, hands are hard, right? And so, I, I mean, you know, she's just going on and doing high school and doing her artwork and everything. And um, so she completed some projects, and there were contests coming up. And so that was cool. I was all, you know, supportive and everything. And um, she started winning the local local art fairs and then she went to regionals and she started winning all the regionals and then she got to the state level and you know they go from like 16,000 entries to the top 3,000 get down to Houston then they narrow it down to the top very top and lo and behold she won the top in the state and um for two of her paintings of, on hands, I only am going to make you look at one of them, but it's my favorite. It's a picture of my dad paint, uh, tying an old boot. Whoops. And she named it Knots, you know, like you've got knots in your shoestring. So she named it Knots. And um, so that one and the other one were made into a brochure for the state of Texas. That was the centerfold. And they conscripted her art to be put in the art museums around the state for a whole year. Two months in Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and Fort Worth. And so that blew my mind. And then one day, my niece calls me from Kansas. She's quite a bit older than my daughter is. And she goes, Aunt Faith. Um, she just had heard about all this winning stuff, and she goes, Wer weren't Kristen's hands deformed? And I said, yes. And she goes, don't you think that's a little funny? How God would heal her hands and, ju and then just give her this amazing ability to paint hands. And I go, oh, my lands! And I got so excited. I've been so, I just, I just had to, I was just blown away again at the details. You know, God took those crippled, gnarly hands, 
unfolded them, and then he gave them the skill I didn't even know about for 15, 16 years when this happened. Now, is that cool or what? That is amazing. I, would, I, I still am just amazed at the uh, amazing blessings of God. Now, like I said, I tell this story a lot. Any chance you sit down, sit down with me or, or get alone with me, I love to tell everybody, have I told you about my daughter? <laughs> or have I told you about Kristen's story? You know, I just love it. But um, there's times, though, in this world when uh, because it's broken, because there is sin, and all these bad, horrible things do happen, it seems like it doesn't always turn out like that. You know what I mean? There's instances a lot of times where it seems like we go for years and we pray, we're pray, we praying for something and it hasn't been answered the way we want it to be answered yet. Um, I, I have a genetic neuromuscular disease I've had for 42 years that leaves me on the floor having to be turned, fed, and toileted. Many times my children have had to do the, all the care for me when I was on the floor and couldn't take care of them. And so it seemed like, you know, on those ca- on that prayer, it seemed like, you know, why? You know, it, God didn't heal me from this genetic neuromuscular disease, but he's given me the grace to get through it. And my kids have learned a lot of compassion on people that can't help themselves. You know what I mean? So you look for, you, you need to look through the, the struggle and find the beautiful parts of what God is, is still doing for you in that. Another example of shocking things that doesn't make sense is my brother, who is a godly man. He and his wife have lost two of their young sons 11 years apart to in, in critical accidents. And it, it doesn't ever seem right when, you know, we think we're going to go first, you know, the older, the parents. And to lose your children, I, I just can't comprehend it. But I do know this, that when we face these kind of things, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? And that's when you have to search your heart and say, do I trust God? Can I trust God? Really? I mean, not with anybody else listening, but the truth, the real truth inside our hearts. Do we really trust God? And so, um, whoa, oh, I'm, I forgot to show you. This is Kristen. I'm sorry. I didn't even show you that one. And uh, she's five foot 11 and turned out real pretty. And then um, here is my favorite picture. Just a second. Whoop. I had a hard time. There she is at her wedding day seven years ago with my, bro- my boys all, all holding her up, you know, just to, so that's, uh, that was a happy day for me. <laughs> anyway, but when bad times come, this is a verse that I memorized a long time ago because it means so much to me, and I think it would be good for any of us to memorize this one, Psalms 1830. You have to go back and remember, as for God, his way is perfect. And the word of the Lord is flawless. I think of a diamond, a beautiful sparkly diamond. And he is a shield to everyone who takes refuge in him. And so hiding your word, the word in your heart and uh, staying in the word and just digging out the, the nuggets that where God speaks to you or really ministers to you, I recommend you start in Psalms. And that's just loaded because David wrote so much about out of his despair. Uh, He just, he speaks to my heart, or the psalmists speak to my heart a lot. And this one I have made like my life two verses, not just my life verse, but um, it says, though I walk in the midst of, oh, by the way, this is the verse that I claimed in prayer over Pastor Randy when he had his heart surgery a few weeks ago. But it says, (laughs) yes. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemy, and thy right hand shall save me. Now stop. I love this part because, you know, in Isaiah 48, 13, it says where he took his right hand and he spans the universes, and he just, like, could call all the stars by name, and they just stand up when he says stand up. Well, with his one hand, he is... He's holding that hand up against the wrath of your enemies, Satan, the devil. And with his right hand, he's, whoop, right hand, he's going to scoop you up with that strong hand that 
can fling all the stars into the universes. And so is that beautiful, or picturesque, or what? And so then the next verse is, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. So the Lord will perfect that which concerns you. And that word concerns means anything surrounding you or in, involved in your life. Or it could mean the things that concern you, like worry, you know, things you really have on your heart. All of those things are wrapped up in that word concerns. So the Lord will work on it. The Lord will perfect it. Thy mercy endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Now, I wonder how many of you have heard of Elizabeth Whoops. Elizabeth Elliot, hold your hand up. You heard of her? She could speak from personal experience. For those of you that don't know her, when she was like about 24, 25, she'd married this handsome young man named Jim. And he had graduated from Bible college with honors. And he and four other men went to Ecuador on a mission trip. They were going to reach this tribe that were basically totally had never heard hardly heard the gospel and they were all five killed that day by the those indians and so she gets the word and you know she has to deal with at that young age of being a widow and um i loved have you you can read her book through gates of splendor that's really an inspirational book and then she still has a daily radio program you can i mean devotional thing that you can catch some. I love it. But I picked out three things that she has said. She said so many. But she says that, you know, we have a choice when this stuff hits us. We can get better by drawing close to the Lord, or we can get bitter. You don't really have a middle ground there. There's just, if, if you choose to not do anything, you'll probably end up getting bitter. But she says, run to God and stay close to him. Ask God to help you choose joy because sometimes when you're grieving and you're going through all these things, there's nothing wrong with going through the grieving processes. But you sometimes need help, don't you? So ask God for help to control your thoughts and focus on the word. And then she recommends that you do the next thing of obedience. And I thought that was kind of, the first time I heard her say that, I thought, ooh, I like the way she put that. Do the next thing. Not all the things, just the next step. The next step of obedience. And so I like that. Now here's some practical, oops, I'm not doing it right. There we go. Here's some practical things that have really helped me. And there have been quite a few other things I'm not going to tell you about today. But we all face hard things, very hard things that we wish would have never happened, right? And so I started a gratitude list. I recommend it to everybody. Because when you're in a dark spot or your mood's going south, bad, you just need to go back and read and remember all the promises that God has fulfilled to you particularly in your life. Then Eric was asking me like two weeks ago, he goes, what would you do without your music? I keep praise and worship music going loud as I can stand it. And well, I turned it down a little bit when he's coming in so we can talk. But I mean, I... I love and I keep praise and worship music going all the time in my house because God inhabits the praises of his people. And I could be washing dishes or whatever, and I can just stop and raise my hands and dance for the Lord. You know, praise the Lord because, and, he, and that just keeps our relationship fresh. You know what I mean? It's wonderful. Now, if you're going through something really hard, I had a friend tell me one time on another thing, it's really still, still good to get out of the house and go for a walk if you can. You know, get outside, breathe in fresh air. That's healthy. That's good for your body, but it also helps our minds, too, to get out of the house. Now, then look around for somebody else. If you, it won't take long. You'll find somebody else that's hurting at least as bad as you are, if not worse. And then ask God, what can I do for her? How could I bless her? And go find somebody else that you can be a blessing to. That gets you out of your, your own, bleh, you know, your, your thoughts on your own problems. It helps you to see and, and be a blessing to someone else. And then you've already done this one today. You, you're staying in close fellowship with godly Christian other ladies. So you're already on to that one. 
So that's really cool. And then uh, remember that joy and peace, which I think you have to have peace. I know they're both fruits of the Spirit, but I think you have to have peace, really, to have joy. Um, But it all comes from trusting God because he's faithful, he keeps his word, and he will never, ever betray you. He cares. He loves you so much that even if you were the only person on the face of this earth, he would have made a way for you to have fellowship with him. He sent his son to die to forgive your sins so that you could have, you know, sweet fellowship with him. And then he's strong. He still does miracles these days. He really does. I bet there's a lot of testimonies in this room to attest to that. And then he sees every tiny little detail of your life and your struggle, and your sorrow or suffering, and he loves you, and he's got it. He's got it in control. He really, really does. So my prayer is that my story will be um, just give you hope and uh, encourage you and uh, help you to remember that really, truly, God can be trusted. Thank you.